Raise your hand if this sounds familiar. You're deep into your MCAT CP section and you see a question about kinetic energy or ideal gases, including equations. And your mind goes completely blank. You panic, you waste precious seconds scrambling to recall the equation, and in the end you can't even figure it out. Now add to all of that, you're behind on time. Sounds like a nightmare? Well, I've been there, and so have many of my students. But here's the good news. You don't need to memorize every equation blindly. There's a smarter way. The MCAT isn't testing you on your ability to regurgitate equations. It's testing you on how you use them under pressure. And here's a secret. The test gives you all of the clues. The units and the answer choices, the variables in the passage, their breadcrumbs to the right equation. But most students miss this because they're stuck in memorization mode. Hi, I'm Rachel, a mentor with Medlife Mastery. Today, I'm sharing the exact method that I and many of my students use to master CP equations faster, and even derive them on the spot if they forget. I'll also be going over some general CP passage tips, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll never freeze on an equation again. So let's go. This method that I'm gassing up so much, I tend to refer to as following the units. Using the units of the variables in the question, the answer choices, or the passage to reverse engineer or verify equations. Many of you may have been familiar with some version of this, but I'll break down exactly how I study and implement this method. But before that, we should start with some foundational information on units and about their dimensions. So the first question I get a lot is, what are dimensions? I found that many of my students have not been exposed to the concept of dimensions, but in short, they are the building blocks of units. To elaborate on this, Dimensions are the fundamental categories that all units are built from. Think of them like the alphabet of the physics equations. The MCAT focuses on the following five. Mass with the SI units of kilograms. Length with the SI units of meters. Time with the SI units of seconds. Charge with the SI units of coulombs. And temperature with the SI units of Kelvin. Every MCAT unit is just a combination of these dimensions. For example, we have velocity, which we know has units of meters per second, but this is also the dimensions of length over time. Current, we know has units of amps, which also can be expressed as coulombs per second, but this can also be expressed with dimensions of charge over time. In general, when it comes to representing units when I'm faced with an equation on a test, I like to be able to break down each unit into the SI units of its dimensions if I'm stuck. Why am I going through all this work to break down the units? Well, when I'm stuck, and then we express everything in terms of only these five options, we can more easily find connections between the answer choices and the question stem, or the answer choices and whatever values were given in the passage. Also, you can catch errors with these simplified units. If your final dimension starts with length over time or meters per second, but you need length over time squared or meters per second squared, you know the equation that you're using is probably wrong. And then you can go back and try to fix that. Now that you know what dimensions are, let me give you an example, albeit a very oversimplified example of following the units. Take Newton's second law or force is equal to mass times acceleration. In this hypothetical scenario, let's say that you don't remember what force is equal to. So most students will not have to encounter the situation since this is such a foundational equation, but let's just say you do. Let's go back to what we know then. We know that force is in the units, newtons, which can be broken down with the dimensions that we had mentioned earlier into kilograms times the mass per second squared. We also know that meters is in kilograms and acceleration is in meters per second squared. Now we just match the units. We can set them equal to each other in this way down here. And boom, it's a proper equation and it's valid. This works for about 90% of MCAT equations. So don't worry if you didn't know that newtons was equal to kilograms times meters over second squared. That's normal. A lot of students don't know that at first. That's where studying comes in. So now I'll get into general study tips for how to bolster up this strategy. So I start with getting a list of all the MCAT equations. For me, I use my Anki deck. It had a list of about 90 equations, but you can use whatever resource you would like. And for each one, we want to substitute in the units for each variable and then make them equate. If we can't make them equate very easily, then try breaking it down into the SI units of the dimensions like we had talked before. Working through this is a bit time consuming, but it's definitely worth it. It's more active than just regurgitating and you're working with the equation. So it takes, I find at least, it takes fewer run-throughs to get them into your head. I usually tell students to do this starting at about once or twice a week, and then you can lengthen out the time in between sessions. But that really depends on when your test date is. If you're testing sooner, then maybe you should do this a bit more often to really get it into your head. And when you encounter this method, you're probably going to see two versions of equations that might pop up. The first one is similar to this force is equal to mass times acceleration equation. At first, when you haven't figured out all of the SI dimensions of each unit, you might be able to figure that out through that equation. 
So for example, this first time that you're doing it, you're probably gonna get this, and you know for the future that newtons is equal to kilograms times meters over second squared. So this one helps you break down the units and it's a little bit more simple. There's another version where it's more of a proof where you have to work with it actually to get it to equate rather than just substituting in the units. So for example, that might be this equation here, powers is equal to IV. So you can work through this together. For us, power is in watts. And then I, which is current, is in amps. And V, which is voltage, is in volts. And so you can see when we first substitute this in, it's nothing like the prior equation. They don't equate at all. They're not related at all. So now we know we have to break it down a little bit further. So if we, at least we can start with amps, which we had talked about before, which is coulombs per second. And watts, maybe people know that one a bit more off the top of their head. It's joules per second. And then voltage, which this one, a lot of people don't know, and you might have to search it up, but it's equal to joules per coulomb. And now you can see by breaking down a little bit more, you can cancel out the coulombs on this side and you get joules over seconds is equal to joules over seconds. And let's just even break this down further into the SI unit, SI units. But we already know that joules per second is equal to joules per second. So this is more just for you to understand what joules may be equal to. So if we think about another equation that joules is equal to, we can uh, that has joules in it, we can think of maybe the kinetic energy equation. So we know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. And this side, we can replace it. So we have joules is equal to one half, which is dimensionless, mass, which is kilograms, and velocity, which is meters per second, and that's squared. So we know that joules is equal to kilogram meters squared over second squared. So this is the final step where we had broken everything down and now we know this breakdown of joules. Now let's say that you've finished all of your studying and you've gone through the equations multiple times. Now you can pull out any equation you want from the back of your head. Now let's see how we apply this strategy in real time with a question. This specific question is a passage page question, but it can act as a pseudo discrete one here. So we'll treat it as such. With any question, no matter what passage, it's from, whether it's discrete or passage-based, whether it's in chem phys, cars, or bio, bio chem, we always have to start by fully understanding the question stem and picking out the most important pieces of information, the breadcrumbs. So in this case, what I see is important is first we have a specific material that is mentioned. If we had to refer back to the passage, we can use this keyword to help locate where the information about piezoelectric crystal is. But in this case, we know that this passage, since I or this question, since I picked it out ahead of time, is not necessarily requiring the passage. I also see this number, this value here, this value here. And looking back at the question itself, it is asking what is the power? So we're trying to solve for power. Now, let's say even though I've gone through all the equations multiple times, I still can't pull up anything with these values. So let's just try to solve for it using the dimensions, using the units like we had mentioned before. I'm going to first scan over the answer choices to help direct me to figure out what we're trying to solve for. We see watts, so we know that that is going to be the units of what we're solving for. And then I also notice that the answer choices are all in the same magnitude and that the values are pretty different from each other. So this tells me a couple of things is one, we don't have to care about the magnitude we're only solving for the value, and two is we can probably round since the values are so different. If we round that little difference that it will affect the answer with will not really affect us choosing one of the answers. So then looking back at the question stem, I see the other important information is Kelvin. Here we have minutes, which we always have to look at the dimensions, which is time, and that SI units for that is seconds. And then we also have joules per Kelvin. So that's going to be a big pain to break down. I'm going to see if there's a way to relate that first before we break it down into its base units. So watts, we know, also can be expressed as joules per second. And now I see there's already a way that makes sense to me to make these all equate. So I'm not going to break it down further. If I didn't know a way to make them equate, then I would probably keep on going until I saw some kind of connection. So now I'm going to start off with, I see joules per Kelvin here is probably the most similar to this answer choice. And we know that the joules in the joules per Kelvin needs to stay in the numerator. So we're we're gonna keep this in the numerator or just multiply by this. Next, we have Kelvin from the joules per Kelvin that we can't have in the final answer choice since it's not there. So we have to figure out a way to cancel it out. In this case, we have Kelvin here, so we probably just will multiply by that value. Then last but not least, we have seconds in the denominator of the answer choice, and we have seconds as one of our possible values. So we know that we're probably gonna to need to divide by that to get that into the denominator. So it's gonna be divided by seconds. So now let's plug in the values and we're gonna round them like I mentioned earlier. So we have 120 joules per Kelvin and we have 0.7 K. In this case, I'm gonna keep the value here because it's more or less a whole number. If we're putting this into scientific notation, it's gonna be seven. And then we have 300 down here and that's gonna be seconds because we have to convert five minutes to the SI units for the dimension seconds and that's gonna be times 60. So now I'm going to first multiply seven by 120 is equal 
to 84. And then technically, since it would be 120 times seven, it'd be 84, but then we have a point here, a decimal point here. So we're gonna put that decimal point here. And then we have 300 down here. So then I'm gonna make this, if we divide 84 by three, that should give us 28. And so then our answer should be around 0.28. But really we don't even need to consider the magnitudes because we really only care about the value itself. So we know that whatever value that has similar numbers to 28 is gonna be our answer choice, which is 0 0.27. There we have it. So today we covered a way to help more easily memorize all the equations. And then on top of that, even if you don't have them memorized, to figure them out on the spot when you're tackling a question on the CP section. So now you've got a superpower. Whether you memorize the equations or derive them on the spot, you're covered. And if you want to take this any further, our CP mastery course breaks down every equation and strategy so you can walk into test day unshakable. Check out the link below for more details. Remember, the MCAT is a game, and now you've got a cheat code. You got this.